Welcome to the Cisco Netacad CCNA Introduction to Networks video series by Jason Johnson. This video is Chapter 2, Configure a Network Operating System. The material in this video covers the 6.0 version of the Cisco Netacad CCNA Introductions to Networks course. I want to thank you for watching these videos. Your time is appreciated. If you find the material helpful, you can subscribe to my channel. And remember to click the notification button if you want to see when I post new content. If you have any questions, you can leave a comment below. Well, let's take a look at Chapter 2. We're going to have three parts to Chapter 2. We're going to talk about the iOS boot camp. Then we're going to, and, and what the iOS is, the Cisco iOS. We're going to look at the basic device configuration of Cisco devices. And then we're going to look at the address schemes, explain how devices communicate across the network media, configuring a host device with an IP address and so forth. So on 2.1 iOS boot camp, uh, when we talk about the iOS, what are we really talking about? We're talking about an operating system. So when you have hardware uh, with any Cisco device or really any computing device, you're going to have hardware and then you need some type of operating system to communicate with that hardware and tell that hardware what to do. So the operating system allows computers to interact um, with the users or allows a computer to interact with the users. Uh, the user-computer interaction in, the, in, a, in a computer operating system uh, is often done via a mouse, a keyboard, and a monitor. That's the input devices and output devices. The Cisco iOS is also an operating system that sets in or that gets installed to the Cisco devices. The Cisco iOS does allow users to interact with a Cisco device, but in a lot of cases in a different way um, or similar ways like a keyboard uh, and a monitor. Uh, but in a lot of cases, you're going to be using a command line, command line interface or CLI. So you see the term CLI, that's command line interface, instead of a GUI or a graphical user interface, if you look over here on the right hand side, um, typically with a uh, operating system you're going to have some type of GUI or graphical user interface. With most Cisco devices you're going to have some type of command line interface where you put in commands into the device to get it to do what you want it to do. So all Cisco networking devices come with a default iOS and you can upgrade those IOSs um, with feature sets or different, uh, depending upon the device and depending upon the upgrades that Cisco has made with those. So if you're looking for those upgrades and things like that, you need to get on the uh, Cisco website, um, uh, get you know, do your login and uh, get, get that support. And you're going to learn a lot more about that in this course and in the future Cisco courses when you take those. So... The Cisco IOS access. How do we, how do we get how do we get an access? In a normal uh, operating system, we boot up a computer, and when we boot up an Apple device or we boot up a Windows device or a Linux device, we get some type of boot up screen. We log in, and then we start interacting with the device through a GUI or a graphical user interface. With the Cisco device, we connect in some way. We either connect a cable through the console connection. Um, and you take something maybe like a laptop to the server room where your Cisco devices are. Um, if you're in a lab, if you're in a Cisco lab or you're in a Netacad uh, lab or you've got your own lab set up uh, that you're working with to study for the Cisco, um, you take your computing device and you connect some type of cable to that Cisco device, either through the console and you can do that through an older COM port um, you know, on a device and then into the uh, RJ45 connection. It looks like a Cat45 or a network uh, connection. And then, um, oh, or in the newer devices, we have USB uh, to, to uh, RJ45. And those get plugged into the console. And then we um, pull up the command line. And we'll, or the, we pull up the, um, not the command line, uh, but we pull up the uh, terminal. And we'll take a look at that later on in this session. And then uh, you'll be learning the, um, the terminal and putting in command lines on those. We also can connect through a virtual terminal, through the network, through either Telnet or SSH. And that's where we can, uh, we, we, once we get our network settings put in place and we're connected on the network, we have an IP address and so forth, we'll be able to telnet in and you don't have to physically go to the device. You can do that uh, remotely. The terminal em emulation programs that we use, um, m usually, and I think what we're going to learn most in this course is on the Windows platform, but you can also do this through uh, Linux and, um, and through the Apple uh, operating systems. You have different terminals. Uh, you have either PuTTY, TerraTerm, or Secure CRT, or some of the more popular ones, and those are um, just basically software that lays on top of your Windows or your um, your operating system that then opens up the terminal to the Cisco device. And this is a PuTTY configuration here. Uh, we're creating a, a session, and we're going to you know click on here. We're going to tell it we want to do SSH, 
and then we're going to load that and then uh, once we connect then we can go in and get the terminal pulled up and we'll be able to see all of the output from that Cisco device onto our terminal. Now when we're navigating to iOS we're looking at the back of a router here and when we look at this you got a power you know we, we don't have power plugged into this one here uh, but we do you know you don't have the power cord plugged in but you do have your power switch here and you have your uh, console port right here usually on Cisco um, I always look for the light blue that's your console so you got USB right here and you got RJ45 right there that's uh, RJ45 that's USB that you plug in and I know this is kinda small here and I, I wish I could pull it up a little bit larger I didn't get that on the PowerPoint pulled up uh, but if you are working in packet tracer or you can uh, you can just uh, pull up on um, uh, really any you can pull up on the internet any image if you don't have a router in front of you or a, a, a switch a Cisco you can pull that up on any um, uh, and, and you just search for that and look at the back picture and you can see usually it's light blue is going to be the console input the Cisco iOS modes of operation the initial configuration must be done via a console connection you do not have IP addresses and you do not you cannot tell net in uh, originally uh, or on first boot up you've got to be able to go in through the console so you have to have physical access to that device and the configuration is done via command lines and the primary command modes are either user exec mode or privileged exec mode and you're gonna get f very familiar with those as we work through this course uh, and as you go into Cisco you're gonna you're gonna know and you just need to know the difference between user exec mode and privileged exec mode and what each each one is and, and how to get to each one and where you are when you're working in the uh, command line so the configuration command modes the configure terminal or config term um, configure terminal command enters the global configuration mode sub configuration modes are accessible through the privileged exec mode and some examples of those would be um, you know if you do uh, if you go in and they've got a misspelled word right there look at that um, switch <laughs> I didn't catch that on my first uh, walkthrough of this so that's a misspelled word there just kind of ignore that and then here's here's a, an actual one switch where you do config if and uh, the pound sign right there lets you know uh, what mode you're in uh, and and then when you run that then you'll be able to get your commands returned and now navigating between the iOS modes uh, the enable command enters the privileged exec mode and the exit command exits the parent command mode back and if you keep press if you keep doing exit that's gonna exit you out of the um, privileged exec mode back to the login screen now the basic iOS command structure uh, the general syntax for a command is the command followed by the appropriate keywords and arguments a keyword is a specific parameter defined in the operating system and an argument is not predefined it's a value or variable defined by the user so that's an argument uh, that you're gonna put in that um, for example like if you're putting in an IP address the argument would be the IP address so an iOS command syntax provides the pattern or format that must be used when entering a command you you're gonna need to uh, learn the syntax or the command syntax in putting in um, command line interface with the uh, Cisco devices because there's a certain way that you have to do it and the Cisco iOS command reference is the ultimate source of information for a particular I iOS command I don't have a picture to pull up here on my PowerPoint but there is a um, a Cisco book you can go to the um, Cisco website or Cisco press and there's a command line um, it's the uh, command line interface um, I'll try to uh, what, what in fact what I'll do is I'll get a picture of that and I'll put that at the end of the video um, so make sure that you watch to the end of the video and I'll put a put that in and I'll put uh, information on that in the description below so the iOS help feature uh, which is nice uh, on the iOS devices or Cisco devices the iOS has two forms of help uh, you have context sensitive help and command syntax help and you can use your uh, you, you can pull help up if you're not sure about what a command is or how to finish a command off or what commands are available you can use the help to do that and we're gonna learn that later on we're just talking about it right now so hotkeys and shortcuts commands and keywords can be shortened to a minimum number of characters that identify a unique selection so for example if um, you, you can you can shorten it down if it's unique so if you have two different commands uh, let's say you have um, uh, two different config commands you can't put in config um, by itself but if you only have one config command available you can just put in co or con and uh, that and, and you'll learn how to shorten those down as we work with the uh, iOS and then line editing keyboard shortcuts such as control a are also supported okay so let's take a look at 2.2 basic device configuration the device names when we look at these um, the host names allow devices to be identified by network administrator over a network 
or over the internet. And what you'll want to do is you'll want to configure the device name so that um, they make some kind of logical order. So, for example, if you have a router on the third floor, you might put, you know, third floor router um, or you put, you know, put, put 3R router or something like that so that you know where it's located. Or you might put uh, the name of the floor in the building to know where it's located. So instead of just leaving it switch, uh, you would name that. For example, you would change the host name to SW Floor 1, so Southwest Floor 1. And so now you have a very specific device name so that you know where that location is and you know where that device is and you know which device you're working on. So it's important that uh, should also be displayed in the topology. So as you're creating your topology for your network, you want to make sure that you keep your host names that you create here or put on the actual devices that you update your topology that you keep on record so that if anybody else walks in to work on your network, they are going to know um, wh where everything is. Now to configure the host names, the I iOS host name should, and these are these are some um, these are some things that have to or need to happen. It needs to start with a letter or should start with a letter. It can contain no spaces. It needs to end with a letter or digit. It uses only letters, digits, and dashes. Don't put any uh, weird characters in there. But you you can put dashes, but you're not going to want to put um, asterisks and uh, you know different things like that, ampersands and things like that. And it also needs to be uh, less than 64 characters in length. So you have a limitation there on that. Okay, so limiting access to the, to the device configuration because it is about security because you don't want just somebody you don't just don't want anybody walking in and being able to configure your devices or take your devices down or change things on there so you want to secure the device access you secure privilege exec mode and user exec mode access with a password you secure vir virtual terminal lines with a password as well and then you configure your passwords you want to use strong passwords and you want to avoid reusing passwords from a security standpoint, you never want to use the same password on different devices. And the reason you don't do that is because if you lose your, if, when I say lose your password, if somebody gains access to your password, let me say it that way. So if somebody gains access to your password on one router and all of your routers and switches throughout your whole organization have the same password on them, they're going to have access to all those devices. So what you want to do is... Um, make sure that you're using different passwords on different devices. Now, that is going to, um, and this is where there's some debate about how to track those passwords, whether you put those in. Um, I do not do not recommend putting those into any type of spreadsheet or Google Docs or anything like that because those documents could be lost. I recommend getting some type of encrypted password program and using that, whether it's either offline uh, that, you, that you save somewhere and put on a server or you put somewhere, but have some type of encryption on that password program and that way you have access to that and make sure multiple people have access to that. You want to encrypt your passwords on your devices. The Cisco iOS displays passwords in plain text by default, but passwords should be encrypted. So you want to make sure that that's a step that you take whenever you set up a new device. And then banner message, you also want to make sure that you put banner messages on your device. You may think to yourself, well, I don't really need a banner message because I'm going to be the only one that ever logs into this device. So why do I really care if there's ever a banner message here? Well, the reason you do that is because in some countries and in some legal, um, in, in, in from a legal standpoint, um, you want to make sure that you don't imply that a login is welcome. So you don't want to put like, hey, everybody welcome, or hello, Dave, glad you came back. You, you want to make sure that from a, le so you're covering yourself legally, that you put some type of banner that says, um, you know, it's part of a legal process. Uh, you know, so if someone it does break in and there's a prosecution on it, you want to be able to say, no, there was never an intent to invite anyone into our system. And you want to have a clear warning on there that unauthorized access is not allowed. You know, something along those lines. What I recommend doing is checking with, if, you have a, if you're working for a company with the legal department, check with them or check with uh, Cisco. Uh, as you learn, go through this course, you're going to see uh, some different um, wording that you can put on your banner. But make sure that you're going to put some warning on there that is not inviting anybody into your devices. Now, saving the configurations after you've one of the most important things that you can always do uh, besides security is when you're working with your devices, you always want to um, save your running config file because as you update your configuration file, it is not saved. Um, it's, it's only on the current. So if your device reboots on you, it's going to pull up whatever's been saved last or whatever your, your saved configuration file is. So after you've saved the running configuration file, you want to, that file, um, 
the file stored in the MVRAM contains all the commands that will be used upon the startup or reboot. So if you don't save your current configuration file that you've updated, it's not going to be in the MVRAM. So the next time it's going to boot, it's going to revert back to that last save. So the MVRAM does not lose its contents when the device is powered off. So you, you alter the running configuration. So the file stored in RAM is your running configuration. That reflects the current configuration. Um, it, it modifies the effects of the operation of the current device of the Cisco device immediately. Let me say it that way. RAM loses all of its contents when the device is powered off or restarted uh, because it's, um, you know, it's, 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 it's not stored. It's just RAM. It's, it's, and so uh, you want to make sure that you take that configuration and save it to the NVRAM. So you capture the configuration to a text file. You can do that as well. Configuration files can all be sa also be saved and archived to a text document. So all of your updates and changes and the configuration can then be edited with any text editor and placed back in the device except for passwords. The passwords won't because they'll be encrypted. Now 2.3, the address schemes. Um, when we talk about address schemes on devices, we do put um, IPv4 and IPv6 addresses. Um, at the point of this recording, it's still common to put IPv4 addresses on Cisco devices. So each end device on a network must be configured with an IP address because you have to be able to um, you know, access those, the end devices. Uh, for example, the desktop has to have an IP address so that it can see the other devices on the network. It enables devices to establish end-to-end -end communication and the structure of, V4, of the V4, and I'm gonna say, I'm gonna stop here and say, when I say IPv4 or IPv6, I don't say the IPv, I just say V4 or V6 when I'm talking about it. So as you're watching my videos and I say V4 or V6, that's, uh, you'll know that's what I'm talking about. The V4 is called the dotted decimal notation and it's represented by four decimal numbers between zero and 255. And V6 is the most recent version of IPv or of internet protocol and the replacement for the more common IPv4. And V4 will eventually be phased out, but it's just taking a long time to do that because it's just it updating devices and things like that. It'll just take a long time. So V4 and V6 will be used, you know, in, in the meantime together. And then V6 will become more prevalent and the V6 will be phased out. Now on the interface and ports, network communications depend on interfaces and the cables that connect them. Different types of a network media have different features and benefits. And the Ethernet is the most common local area network LAN technology, cop, copper Ethernet. Cat5, uh, Cat6, Cat5e, Cat6. Uh, SVI provides a means to remotely manage a switch over a network. So uh, the SVI, so you can manage those over a network, which gives you uh, and the nice ability not to have to be able to travel to a location or if you work from home, or let's say it's in another city, you don't necessarily have to travel to that city, you can remotely access that device and update it. Now, when we're configuring an IP address, the manual IP can configure address configuration for end devices. If you need to go in, and this is for a Windows um, win Windows computer here, and they have manually configured the IP address here. They did not have a DHCP server. So when you first are working with your device and you don't have a DHCP server on your network, you're going to need to manually put an IP address in. And in this case, they use 192.168.1.10, used a... Uh, 255, 255, 255 subnet, and they gave it a default gateway of .1.1. .1. They didn't need to put a DNS because we're not going out to the internet and doing any DNS resolution at this point. But you go in and on your window, and this is on Windows, and if you're on a Linux device, you'll know how to do it on Linux and, and Macs is, uh, the same way. You can go in and manually configure that. But you're going to go in and you're going to manually configure your IP address. If you get an automatic IP address configuration for end devices, that's the DHCP uh, that enables automatic v4 address configuration for every end device uh, that has DHCP enabled and you don't need to do any extra configuration. That's if you have a DHCP server running or DHCP service running. Now the switch virtual interface or SVI configuration, uh, to configure an SVI on a switch, you want to use the interface on VLAN 1 on global config and VLAN 1 is not an actual physical interface but a virtual one. Now, when we verify connectivity, when we go in on our device and what we've done here uh, on our command line here, we've used the ping command and we went in on our Windows machine and we've pinged 192.168.10.2 and we've got, a com we've got a ping command back saying, yes, we got a reply back. And what the ping command does is it takes just a small amount of data, uh, in this case, 32 byte, bytes of data, not bits, but bytes of data, and sends that across and says, okay, am I getting a reply back to that IP address? 
And we can also here, we ping another one here and we get it back. And if you ping and you don't get anything back, if it says un, un, um, destination unreachable or a destination host unreachable or something along those lines, I don't remember off the top of my head exactly what it says, uh, but you'll know that you're not getting a ping back and something is not right. Either IP is not set up properly or a network's not connected properly or something along those. But that ping is, is, helps you do an end-to-end -end connectivity test. And it's real common, and down here, down here below, we're doing it on the command line on the uh, switch here, on switch one. We've done show IP interface brief, and that's pulling up and that's saying, yes, we've got uh, VLAN one has 192.168.10.2 configured. And over here, we can ping 192.168.10.2. And so this Windows machine or end device can then ping this device here and it's gonna get an IP, it's gonna get a ping back from it. Okay, so what we have looked at in chapter two is we've explained the features and functions of the Cisco iOS software. Uh, we've configured the initial settings on a network device using the Cisco iOS software. We've taken a look at that in chapter two. Uh, and then we've also looked at giving an IP address scheme and why we do that, configuring the IP address manually on the end devices and why it's important. And then uh, it provides end-to-end -end connectivity in a small to medium-sized business network. All right, well, I hope this uh, video was helpful for you. And remember to subscribe and click that notification button below if you wanna see when new videos are posted on my channel. Um, I do uh, these Cisco videos or I do other tech videos for my students, but I also do gaming videos. Um, so the uh, your, your time is appreciated watching these videos and I do I do appreciate the feedback. So if you have questions or if you just wanna give me a thumbs up down below, that that's, uh, that's appreciated as well. So I hope you have a great day.